All right, it looks like it's time to get started. Um, hello, I'm Drew Fustini. I want to talk today about Linux on RISC-V. I'm a Linux kernel developer for Baylib. Uh, we're an embedded software consultancy based in Nice in France. We have about 50 engineers around the world, and we contribute to open source projects like Linux, U-Boot, Android, and Zephyr. I'm also on the board of directors of the BeagleBoard.org Foundation. You might be familiar with the small single board computer named the BeagleBone. I'm also part of the Open Source Hardware Association, so if any of you are building open hardware projects, you can go through our certification process. I'm, an, I'm also an ambassador for RISC-V International, and I'll be talking more about that organization later. So RISC-V is a free and open ISA, or instruction set. Originally started back in 2010 at UC Berkeley, um, and the V is as in the Roman numeral for five because it's the fifth RISC instruction set to come out of Berkeley. And the reason why I say it's free and open is because the specification for the ISA are available under an open source license, the Creative Commons Attribution License. Um, and it comes in two volumes. There's the unprivileged specification and the privileged specification. And I'll get into more of that a little bit later. So what's different about RISC-V? It's not the first open instruction set, but it's definitely gained a lot of popularity. Um, one of the advantages is a simple clean slate design. So the people at Berkeley that created it, they um, try to avoid any dependencies on microarchitectural style, so it's applicable to a wide range of implementations. It's also modular, so the idea is with these extensions, you can go from a small microcontroller all the way up to a large uh, vector machine like a supercomputer. Um, the key idea here is that there's a stable base. So we have base integer ISAs and standard extensions, which are now frozen, and those won't change. And then we add new functionality through optional extensions, but not new versions of the ISA. So we have uh, these base integer uh, ISAs here. So we have the, uh, the lowest one, which is 32-bit. Um, and it's actually quite small. So it's actually quite useful for embedded systems or also for teaching, um, since it's um, much simpler than other instruction sets. Um, for the purposes of Linux, RV64i is going to be the most common one. That's the 64-bit. And there's even uh, space in the instruction encoding to have, uh, in the future, 128-bit. So there's the base integer registers, um, and we either have the X lane defines the register width, so we either have the X lane of 32 in RV32, or we have the X lane being 64 in RV64. And we have 32 registers um, and a pro program counter. Um, there's a great talk by one of the people at Berkeley that created it um, about the base I say that goes more into the instruction coding scheme. And we don't normally refer to the, the instruction, the, sorry, we don't normally refer to the registers as X1 through X31. We usually refer to them as their name um, that's defined in the um, ABI. So you'll, you'll normally see the more symbolic register names there. So in addition to those base integer ISAs, we have standard extensions. Um, so we have M for multiply and divide. A for atomic, which is important for multiprocessing machines. Um, F, D, and Q are different precisions of floating point. We have G, which kind of takes several of those and groups them under one uh, letter, which is, stands for general purpose computing. And then we have C for compressed instructions. Uh, so this is similar to the arm thumb. And uh, one thing that's key for Linux, um, if you're looking for a RISC-V core that could support Linux, is RV64GC is what most Linux distributions are targeting. So that's a good um, RISC-V ISA string to look for in the, when you're, if you're interested in Linux. And then back in 2021, several new um, extensions were ratified. So 15 extensions were, uh, um, 15 new specifications were ratified, which included 40 extensions. Um, some of the important ones there were vector for um, variable length vector computing, hypervisor, um, some cryptography instructions, and also bit manipulation. So um, since this is a highly modular and extensible, uh, extensible ISA, um, it gives you the freedom to pick and choose what, what you want for your processor design. But the downside to that is it creates a large number of possibilities. So one way of dealing with this complexity is with the, uh, this concept here of profiles. Um, so we group several of the common uh, um, different extensions into profiles. Um, so there's two different categories. One is for uh, microcontrollers, which is RVM. Um, that's meant for micro RISC-V microcontrollers that be running bare metal or, or RTOSs. And then RVA, where the A is for applications. And that would be a profile for a processor. It would be running a full operating system like Linux. 
Um, this is still, the specification is still, still being worked on. Um, you can find out more. Um, there was a talk at the RISC V Summit. Um, but in the future, uh, the idea here is that you'll be able to look at what profile the RISC V core supports to know, uh, uh, people to figure out the software compatibility instead of having to look at um, uh, you know, these, this string of many different letters. It, there'll just be something like RVA22. If you want to learn more about the RISC-V instruction set, um, there's this uh, short book. It's about 100 pages. Um, takes you through real quick. Teaches you the, the basics of the instruction set called the RISC-V Reader. And while it started at Berkeley, the specifications are now developed by an organization called RISC-V International. Um, it's a not-for-profit with over 2,700 members now. So that's uh, companies and universities and even individuals. Um, it's based in Switzerland. Um, Anyone can become a member if, as an individual or as a nonprofit organization. You can even join free of cost. Um, there's a wiki that has a lot of helpful resources that I'm always pulling up when, I, when I'm trying to look up something. Um, and there's also a lot of the development of the specifications happening. It happens on different mailing lists uh, for different topic areas. Um, you do need to be a member to participate in the mailing list, um, but you can become a member free of cost. And the archives of those mailing lists are public. Uh, and then many of, the, many of the different working groups and technical groups and special interest groups, they might have bi-weekly or weekly meetings or sometimes monthly meetings. So you can find all of those on the technical meetings calendar. I run a bi-weekly virtual meetup called RISC-5 Open Hours. So the idea here is just kind of have a, a casual opportunity for people to discuss what's going on in RISC-5 and ask questions and talk about ideas we have. The context is mostly around open source software support and dev boards, but it could really be what anyone that joins is interested in talking about. Um, so we do it twice a month, um, one that's in a time zone that's good for Asia. I'm, so I'm based in the US um, on the West Coast, so uh, we do one that's in the evening on the West Coast of the US, and then that's uh, the next morning in Asia. So we have the next one coming up on October 12th for that, and then uh, later in October will be the one that is good for early evening in Europe, um, which is the morning in the US, and that'll be on the 26th. So sometimes people ask me if RISC-V is an open source processor. So RISC-V itself is just a set of specifications that are under an open source license. Uh, so RISC-V implementations can be open source and they can be proprietary. Um, but to me, the thing that I'm excited about is that open specifications make open source implementations possible. So an open ISA like RISC-V makes it possible to design open source processors. And there are several open source cores that are already um, um, out there and are being used, um, some, sometimes in FPGA, sometimes being taped out into ASICs. Um, so there's several from Academia, Rocket and Boom from Berkeley. There's also um, a family of cores called Pulp from ETH Zurich. Um, and then for the microcontroller area, there's Swerve, which was created by Western Digital, now as part of the Chips Alliance. There's another group called the Open Hardware Group that's trying to create verified IP um, under their name Core-V. Um, so these are open source designs that they're trying to make it easy to drop into um, ASICs that companies might be designing. Um, Google has created the Open Titan um, Silicon, Root of, Silicon Root of Trust project, and they're using a core from low risk called IVEX. Um, and then one thing I was quite excited about is Alibaba has a chip design division called T-Head. Um, they've released their cores as open source. Uh, one of these cores is actually an SOC that's available right now on the market. So in terms of the, the software ecosystem, RISC-V, it's been around uh, starting in 2010, so it's been around for a while now. And the software ecosystem is pretty mature for it. So it kind of has all the things you'd expect. Uh, there's support in Linux and in BSDs, FreeBSD, OpenBSD, um, FreeRTOS and Zephyr, and then have all the usual tool chains and runtimes you'd expect, like GCC, glibc, um, binutils, clang, um, and then there's also runtimes that people are use nowadays, like V8, um, Rust, Go, um, OpenJDK, including JIT support, um, and pretty much everything else you can think of. There's a group in uh, China at the Academy, of, uh, the Academy of Sciences called the PLCT Lab that's been doing a lot of porting and enablement. So one of the things that's important to running an operating system on RISC-V is the privileged architecture. So this defines three modes. So uh, at the bottom, we have machine mode or M mode, and that would be where the firmware would run. And then we have supervisor mode or S mode, and that's where our OS kernel like Linux would run. 
And then at the top, the least privileged mode is user mode, and that's where our user space would run. And the way we transfer control between these is by using the E call or environment call. So this allows the user space program running in M mode to do an E call to call into the uh, OS kernel, and, uh, vice, and also the OS kernel can then make an E call to go into the machine mode firmware. So another concept that's important to RISC-V in the privileged architecture are these control and status registers. Um, so these have their own dedicated instructions to read and write, um, and they're also specific to a mode. So when you're in S mode, you won't be able to see the CSRs that are there for M mode. Um, and this gives all sorts of important information you need for, for the, the kernel needs to know what's going on, such as machine status and for a bunch of other sort of conditions that are happening. There's also support for virtual memory um, with several different levels of page tables. So from the basic uh, three-level page table for 32-bit that RV32 uses all the way up to a 57-bit uh, um, five-level page table called SV57. There's two types of traps that happen in RISC-V. So we have both exceptions and interrupts. Um, and it depends on the first bit there whether or not it's an exception or interrupt. And uh, there's a register that says what the source of the interrupt was, um, either for S mode when we're running in supervisor mode or for M mode when we're running in machine mode. One concept that I wanted to bring up here before I go farther is heart. So you'll see this in the RISC-V specifications. It was not a term I'd seen before, and this stands for hardware thread. Um, so each RISC-V core uh, contains an independent fetch unit. Um, but those might have multiple threading, or what we might call SMT. Um, so each RISC-V core could contain multiple hearts. Um, so each heart it is basically a processor from Linux perspective. So if you think of a RISC-V system where we have two, car, two cores and two hearts per core, Linux would see four processors, or on the classic Linux boot screen, we would have four penguins. So in terms of interrupts, we have uh, local per heart interrupts, um, and those are sent via something called the Clint, which is the core local interrupter. And then global interrupts come from something called the platform level interrupt controller, or the PLIC. Um, so the, the Clint would be sending us things like timer interrupts and software interrupts for IPI, um, and then we would be getting our external interrupts from our peripherals, like a, a t um, things like an MMC controller, or a UART or something like that would be coming through an external interrupt, which would go through the PLIC and eventually go to the heart. Something that's been developed more recently, um, because this scheme is actually quite simple for a modern system. So something that's been, then been developed more recently is the Advanced, the advanced Interrupt Architecture, or AIA. Um, so this defines new types of interrupt controllers. So there's the Advanced Platform Level Interrupt Controller, and that replaces the, the normal PLIC with the A PLIC. Uh, but more importantly, it has a new type called the Incoming Message Signal Interrupt Controller. And this is important for PCI Express, because in PCI Express you have the MSIs, the Message Signal Interrupts. Um, in addition, there's a new Clint, uh, a new uh, thing that develops local, that delivers local interrupts called the A-Clint. Um, and this is backward compatible, but also adds some new capabilities that makes it more efficient. So I've been talking about M mode and S mode. Um, and let's talk about the typical boot flow and how we get from M mode into S mode. So we start off normally on an SOC with a boot ROM, and that would go to a first stage bootloader, either U-Boot SPL or vendor firmware. Um, that would do things like initialize the DDR memory, um, and then eventually we would load U-Boot or another bootloader, and then that would load and jump into Linux. Uh, but there's something in the middle of there between M mode and S mode that's kind of specific to RISC-V, and that's called SBI. So SBI is the supervisor binary interface. So this is a non-ISI RISC-V specification. Um, so that means it doesn't add any instructions to RISC-V, but it defines a calling convention between that supervisor mode or S mode and M mode, which is the machine mode. Um, and the important thing here that it does is allows us to write S mode software like Linux, like our OS kernel, that can be portable across different implementations, so across different M mode implementations. So the way it works here is we have several different levels here. And um, you know, I mentioned earlier we had um, we would do e-calls between these. So when we're running in user space, we do an e-call, which is our system call. We go down into S mode. And the way S mode communicates with M mode is through SBI. So it does an e-call into M mode 
And the call convention there is defined by this uh, uh, SBI, which is the Supervisor Binary Interface. Um, so there are several extensions um, to SBI that describes what you can do, essentially kind of like the function calls that you can make. Um, so there's a base one, which just allows you to find out basic information about the machine. Uh, there's a timer extension that allows us to program the clock for the next event. That, um, there's things for doing interprocessor interrupts, so being able to send uh, interrupts to other hearts, um, and also being able to send a fence instruction to other hearts as well. More recently, there has been some additional uh, extensions to SPI, um, such as the heart state management. So this allows the S-Mode software like Linux, like our operating system kernel, to be able to stop and start or suspend a heart. So this is important for being able to do um, power management and things like that. We also now have the ability to do a, a system reset. So the supervisor mode software like Linux um, can request the M-Mode uh, firmware to shut down the system. There's also now performance monitoring uh, unit instructions as well. So this is really important to be able to do performance monitoring things with commands like perf. So that's now also supported as well with this SBI extension. In addition to our normal sort of mode, we have the hypervisor extension, which has an additional layer here. So we, we gain the uh, hypervisor supervisor extension mode where our host OS kernel would run. And then we have the virtualized supervisor mode, which our guest kernel could run. So it just adds a couple more layers there um, versus the normal uh, S mode and M mode setup. So that's the specification. And then the common open source implementation is named OpenSPI. Um, and this is kind of implemented in different layers. So there's a core library, and there's platform-specific libraries, and then there's even full reference firmwares that will run on certain dev boards. This, in addition to helping boot the system and put it into S mode, this also provides those runtime services. So I was mentioning these different um, extensions here, um, and those are the services that OpenSPI is implementing. It determines basically what we can call from our OS kernel into the M mode firmware. So previously with OpenSPI, you would kind of have to add code for every new um, RISC V core that was being developed. Like for every new SOC, you would have to add code to OpenSPI. Um, and this was not the best approach. So we now have something called OpenSPI generic platform. So if you have a new RISC V chip, you don't need to add code to OpenSPI. You can just describe the system in a device tree, um, and that will be passed on to U-Boot. So we don't need to go and uh, add C code for each new platform, which is quite nice. It also gives us a possibility to have one OpenSPI binary that could be included on a RISC V distro, and we wouldn't have to have separate binaries for every different uh, system. There's also support for UEFI that's been added. Um, so UEFI is the standard interface between firmware and the operating system for x86 traditionally and also more recently ARM64. Um, so there is support uh, in RISC -V, for RISC-V UEFI and U-Boot and also Tiana Core 2, uh, Tiana Core EDK2. Um, there's also support in GRUB2 to be a UEFI payload on RISC-V and there's support in Linux as well for this. One of the problems, though, was that, uh, so typically in a RISC-V system, it passes the boot heart ID in a register, but that violates the UEFI calling convention. So one thing that had to be done for RISC-V was a, a new uh, boot protocol had to be added for, so that uh, it could, um, in the correct way, the proper way, pass the boot heart ID, which is essentially saying which heart uh, is starting the RISC-V system. And that's been proposed in as, a, as an extension to UEFI. So one of the ways that we're going to pull all these different things together is through a platform specification. It's still being developed, but the idea here is that we will have uh, a way for off-the-shelf off software like an enterprise Linux distro to be able to say, okay, I am certified to run on these RISC-V platforms and a RISC-V uh, like server or something like that in the future could say, okay, I conform to the RISC-V platform specification, so I'll be able to support a, a RISC-V Linux distro that, that uh, conforms to that specification. Um, there are kind of two different categories here. There is um, RVM, CSI, which is meant for microcontrollers, so I'm not going to really talk about that here. Um, but the one that we're interested in in the context of running a full operating system like Linux is OS-A, that A stands for application. 
Um, and it kind of breaks down into a couple different categories. There's common requirements, and then there's a specific one for embedded, and another one for server platforms. So the common requirements between them is to use these profiles. So I mentioned earlier there's these profiles in development. So you'll be able to say something like RVA22, which will remember those different ISA extension letters. It will specify a bunch of those different letters. So we won't have to list out all those different letters. We'll just say that this, you know, that this uh, platform complies with RVA22. And then it'll tell you all the different ISA extensions that are required. Um, there's also common requirements for things like debug and timer and interrupt controllers, like I was mentioning with the advanced interrupt architecture, um, and also talks about the calling conventions and ABI and those sorts of things. The main thing for the embedded platform is that uh, they borrowed the embedded based boot requirements that originally came out of ARM. So that's kind of the baseline here is basically you need to support everything that EBBR mandates. Um, so, and on top of that, um, there's a few things that are RISC-V specific, but essentially if you're familiar with the embedded base free requirements from, from ARM, is essentially all of that. Um, so we, could, we can use something like U-Boot, uh, where we're using device tree to describe the hardware, and then we're using UEFI as the interface to boot the OS. But for the server platform, the goal is a little bit different here. So the goal is to be able to be compatible with enterprise Linux distros. Um, and in that area, ACPI is, is quite common. So the server platform is going to mandate that ACPI needs to be used to describe the hardware instead of device tree. There's also additional things like requiring PCI Express, certain things like uh, reliability and availability, RAS, and then uh, like requiring ECC RAM and similar things like that. These are all still in development, so uh, there is the possibility to, to get involved and help define uh, if you have ideas about what you think should be included in these different types of platforms. Um, in terms of ACPI platform, um, there is now a specification for how this, how ACPI can be implemented on RISC-V. In order to do that, um, because of the, some of the hardware differences with RISC-V, there were some ACPI tables that need to be added. Um, and those are going to be proposed to be able to be added into that specification. Um, it's been driven a lot by uh, Sunil from Ventana Microsystems, and he has a he had a presentation at the Risk Five Summit um, at, last December that goes into more details there. Um, also at Linux Plumbers earlier this week, and I have a link a little bit later on about that. Um, so there is some full support in QEMU for Risk Five. And in fact, a lot of the development of the new extensions is done in QEMU. So QEMU is like really core to the development of the RISC-V specs and doing proof of concept implementations. So support in the Linux kernel for the RISC-V architecture has been there since back in 2018 with Linux 4.15. Um, Palmer did the initial port and he, he was part of the original team at Berkeley uh, and he's still the maintainer for the RISC-V architecture in Linux. Um, the development is done on the Linux Risk 5 mailing list. Um, you can view the archives on lore. Um, and there is actually a fair amount of discussion now on the Risk 5 um, Risk V channel on Libera chat. So Palmer and some of the other um, active uh, Linux Risk 5 developers are on there pretty regularly. So some things that were added, added in the last 12 months that were important were uh, KVM Risk 5 support was finally added in Linux 5. 16. So I mentioned that there was that new hypervisor specification. We now have support for that um, in KVM. Um, I also mentioned how there was that extension in SBI to be able to tell the system to reset itself, and that's now supported as of Linux 5.17. There was also support in Linux 5.18 to uh, support that five-level page table. Um, so that allows us to have 57 bits for our virtual address space, which is quite large, it's 128 uh, petabytes. Um, and there was also some, this is actually one that's actually quite important. Um, there was a now support to be able to handle all those neat perf commands. So those things that you see like Brent and Greg doing actually should now work on RISC-5 because previous actually it was, a, it was a, maybe two or three years ago we got support for eBPF. So we can do all those fancy um, performance monitoring things now on RISC-5. Um, there's also in uh, Linux 5.18 a support for um, CPU idle support. So using that heart, uh, heart state management in OpenSBI, we can tell different hearts to suspend, to stop and start and suspend. Um, so that's tied into the CPU idle framework. Um, one of the things that was interesting is along the way as we added extensions, 
our ability to be able to tell Linux what extensions we have kind of fell apart. So those long string of letters were not quite being parsed correctly by Linux. So as a 5.18, it now understands those ISA strings again. So all those little letters that I was showing you in the beginning. And in 5.19, which is released uh, recently, um, back I think at the end of June, um, the support for page-based memory types was added. I'm gonna get into that a little bit later because um, that's kind of a bigger topic. Uh, one of the things that was interesting for systems with very little RAM, like talking like 64 megabytes or 128 megabytes, uh, we now have the ability to have 32-bit binaries on a 64-bit core. The reason here is to have the user space um, libraries and such take up less RAM. Um, so there's a few RIS-5 parts that have like integrated memory on die, and it's very small, so this is helpful for that. Um, there was also new generic uh, ticket-based spin locks. Um, that was added in kexec file support in 5.19. And coming up in 6, which is a little confusing because the pull request said 5.20, but then 5.20 became 6.0. So these are things that will be in 6.0. Um, one of the things here was uh, a support for an extension called SSTC. The idea here is it allows us to be more efficient in being able to uh, generate timer interrupts from S mode, which is where Linux is running. So this is essentially improves the efficiency of being able to use timer interrupts in Linux. Some of the other things that are works in progress is I mentioned that vector uh, extension was passed. Um, so there's a work in progress patch series to support that in Linux. The thing there is with vector ISA, it adds a bunch of new registers. So we have to be able to handle that in context switches and, and a few other things as well. Um, there's also a patch series that's trying to improve the efficiency of uh, interprocessor interrupts as well. So there's several Linux distros that are supporting RISC-V. So um, Fedora has a version. It's not the official version, but um, I think eventually it'll become that. But they have support in QEMU and, and, and for several RISC-V dev boards as well. Um, there's a fellow RISC-V ambassador named Wei Fu at Red Hat, and he is like super excited to get RISC-V run on any Risk five system, or sorry, to get Red, uh, Fedora to run on any any Red uh, Risk five software hardware that exists out there. So um, you can look at the uh, wiki page there on Fedora. They talk about all the different hardware they support. Debian also has a port for Risk five, and it has pretty good coverage. Ninety seven, sorry, ninety five percent of packages are building now uh, in Debian for Risk five. So I think it's actually the top line there on the graph. So. RISC-V actually has pretty good coverage in Debian. And Ubuntu is actually um, uh, kind of starting to officially support um, several different RISC-V boards. Um, so they have a team now. They have several, they've hired several developers from the Linux RISC-V community and U-Boot to work on RISC-V. So they're putting a lot of efforts into supporting RISC-V now. Uh, one of the neat things, too, is they actually have a server-based install now. So normally we're used to like having like SD card-based images, but for one of the dev boards called the Sci-5 Unmatched, it has PCI Express, so you can actually um, kind of do a normal server install of Ubuntu on that uh, NVMe drive. The uh, OpenSUSE is also working on support, and they have tumbleweed images for some of the development boards. Uh, there's a community effort at Arch Linux to build packages, and they're at 90, 95% now. Um, and Gen2 is also working on it. They have uh, stages available for, for um, RISC-5-64. And if you don't need a full binary distro, there's support in Open Embedded in Yocto through the Meta RISC-V layer. Um, so that has support for both QEMU and several RISC-V dev boards. And another way of making a more minimal system, if, you, uh, if you're not in the open embedded Yocto camp, there's also build root. Um, and, hmm? yeah, yeah, build root, yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, you, you, can, uh, you can cheer for things if you want. Um, so there's a really nice tutorial from Michael Optenacker um, about how to build your own uh, RISC-V system from scratch um, that goes through using build root to build open SBI and U-Boot and Linux, and you'll have a little system you can boot up in QEMU. So there is one mass production SOC right now from all winter called the D1. Um, and this has the T -head, Alibaba T head uh, C906 core. Uh, it's a pretty simple system, just one core running at one gigahertz. Um, one of the nice things about this is they reused a lot of the IP from their existing ARM SOCs. Um, so most of the drivers are supported. However, there was one complication 
that um, their T, their, the MMU on the T-head core has this non-standard enhance, enhanced mode that it, uh, they need to be able to support DMA with um, devices that are on non-coherent interconnects. And most of the peripherals that you would care about on this SOC are on non-cache -co non coherent interconnects, so we need that. Uh, so essentially, Linux needs to be able to support this enhanced MMU mode to be able to boot and function on, the, on this SOC. Um, so one of the things that was a bit complicated with, with this um, is that they decided to come up with their own page table entry format to be able to specify memory type. So they, they wanted to be able to say per a page of memory, like, is this cacheable, non-cacheable? So if it's being used for, for DMA, we want to say that it's, it's uh, non-cacheable. So we need the ability there to describe for a page um, what, what, what type of memory it is. Um, fortunately, they used uh, bits that were marked as reserve in the RISC-V privilege spec. Um, later on, um, back at the end of December, there was an official extension for this sort of purpose that was ratified called Page-Based Memory Type Extension, or SVPBMT. Um, however, this format is slightly different, um, so this was a bit of a problem. Uh, and a Linux developer named Heiko Stubner, who's, who's in the audience here, he did a really great job of figuring out a way to be able to support both the standard, uh, the the standard-based uh, page table format, and also the vendor uh, variation from uh, T-head. Um, and he did that through this very interesting mechanism called the Alternatives Framework in Linux. So this allows you, at, at around boot time, uh, to be able to do uh, instruction patching. So a, basically, there's no penalty if you're on a standards-based system or if you're on this T-head system. So it swaps out the different instructions so that there's no penalty the original solution that was proposed was to use function pointers, but that, that imposed a penalty on the systems that were complying with the standards. So this alternative framework was a great solution for that, um, and that worked out quite well, and it's been merged, it was merged and it was released in Linux 5.19. Another, another similar thing that was needed to manage coherency was cache maintenance operations. Um, so this has now been added as an extension to RISC-V as of December. Um, it's a bit of a mouthful, but it's called the ZICBOM. Um, they refer to what you might think of as a cache line as a cache block, uh, and it, it has several instructions there to clean and invalidate or flush, which is both clean and invalidate. Um, uh, and uh, Heiko as well implemented um, this extension in Linux. Um, however, there was a bit of an issue that Alibaba T had designed that core before this extension existed. It was only ratified in December, and they designed this core several years ago. So they defined their own cache maintenance instructions. Thankfully, they lined up pretty cleanly, so they also have invalidate clean and flush. The only difference was the, in, the instructions are different. Um, so Heiko also used the um, uh, alternatives framework to be able to do that instruction patching so we can support both the standard and also the T-head variant, which, which has worked out quite well. Um, and that was actually, um, that patch series has actually been accepted by Palmer, who's the maintainer, and that will be coming up in the Linux 6.0 release. And this will allow us to be able to um, boot uh, the all winner D1 with mainline. There's a little bit of work that still needs to be done to get like the device trees mainline as well, but these were the two really difficult things. So that brings up another, uh, kind of like one of the final topics I wanted to bring up here, which is, it's a bit different with RISC-V because we don't have a company that's just saying like, here, here are the new ISA instructions. So it's all done in the open. So there's, these, there's drafts that go on for many years of these new extensions, which means uh, you know, some people are wanting to do proof of concepts and maybe even get those proof of concepts to support those extensions merged into Linux. But then from the maintainer's perspective, so from someone that's developing support for a new extension, you would like to get that merged as soon as you can because then you don't have to keep on rebasing on the latest version of Linux. From the maintainer's perspective, you don't really want to merge in support for pre-draft specification or extension because it might change and then you have to have this old legacy support and try and support new things. So in general, the rule for uh, the Arch RISC-V directory is that they only support frozen or ratified extensions. Frozen being that it's basically done, and it's just going through this 45-day 45 45-day public review period before it finally gets ratified. Though this policy, if you look at the text, is, was not really verbose enough or specific enough. So we talked about this at Linux Plumbers earlier this week, 
And this links to a, a file in the documentation directory. And I think that's going to get updated to be a little bit more specific because this is a pretty important uh, thing to have guidelines being very clear. And the current ones don't quite cover all the different situations that might come up. And I mentioned plumbers, um, which happened earlier this week. And there was a RISC-V microconference, which is about four hours long. Um, there was a bunch of different interesting presentation and even more interesting discussion. Um, so right now, you can just go watch the live stream where it's just all together. Eventually, they'll be broken up into individual talks. Um, and finally, I was mentioning different developer boards. Um, you can go find them and buy them yourself. But since most of you are probably open source developers, RISC-V International actually has a program to get dev boards out into developers' hands. Um, so you get these slides. I'll show the link at the end. You can click on that link there and go fill out this form um, about what you want to do. Maybe you want to port a piece of software you work on to RISC-V, and then you'll be able to get a dev board sent to you. If you, don't have, if you don't have any hardware, in addition to QEMU, there's another project called Renode. The nice thing here is it has profiles for several RISC-V boards that exist. So you can basically have the exact same environment that you would have had on that physical board. And finally, I have a birds of a feather, which is like a discussion session coming up at 355, which is like after the break following my talk right now. Um, so hopefully we can talk more about RISC-V there and also open hardware in general. So I will take any questions if you have any. Yeah. Res price yeah. So um, I mentioned that all winner D1 SOC. Um, I mean, it's a little underwhelming. It's just a single core. So that exists. There's a couple other vendors that have multi core um, systems that are coming out. The problem right now is like none of those chips are in mass production. So there's like some limited availability for some of those boards. But all winner is the only one that has like a chip in mass production. Also, it's been a really terrible year with supply chain. So I think you will see boards that are kind of more Raspberry Pi-like um, coming out towards like the beginning of next year, hopefully. So will there are. Mm -hmm. Will yeah. they be costing like 50 euros or less? I think they'll probably be more expensive than that, uh, at least for now. But uh, there are some all-win or D1-based boards that are under $50. I think there's even one that's like 30 or $25. But it's just single core. So it depends on what if you if you're a kernel developer or build root developer or something like that, and you want a board to play around with. Uh, the all-winner D1 is a pretty good target for that. Well, something useful for teaching computing. Yeah, I mean, I think the all-winner D1 is pretty good for that. And there will be more interesting SOCs coming out. Um, there's a few different companies that have like done beta versions and limited runs. But I think you'll see a wider full production runs like probably at the beginning of next year because it's so difficult to make dev boards right now. Well, there, there was a, uh, there's actually someone from Raspberry Pi here. I don't want to out him too much, but I spoke to him earlier. So you can find that person and try and convince them, maybe. Maybe you are in a better position. <laughs> I did. No, before my talk, I was like, I'm going to talk about RISC-V next. And I was like, what do you think about RISC-V? And I don't know. He, he seemed uh, maybe unconvinced. But yeah, go ahead. There actually is one board already that has one SD device and then two core um, SD Yeah, yeah. 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 So you mentioned that there is a board called the Vision Five, and that's on Kickstarter right now, um, so that people could um, fund. And um, yeah, I think it's less than a hundred dollars, so that's probably of interest. Um, I think they target shipping like early next year. I think so. Yeah, Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when are you making your next appearance? When do I make my next appearance? Oh, yeah. uh, well, like in like half an hour. Uh, next, uh, next conference. So when, when can you speak to me? Speaking next. Uh, I don't actually know. I mean, uh, something next year. But I, I actually should have mentioned that there is the RISC Five Summit coming up in December in San Jose, in California. I did not actually make the cutoff for the CFP for that, so I won't be speaking there. But that will be like the next RISC V related event. Will be the RISC V summit in December. Any other questions? Oh, mm -hmm. maybe a simple question. Uh, we can try to have both uh, live stream and RISC V. 
Yeah. I'm not sure about that. I mean, I think they're really kind of for different sort of systems. So, I mean, I think for like single board computers and dev boards and stuff like that, that'll all use device tree. But I can imagine that you would want to have a, a picture of, of a single board computer and then to have it with the, with the, with the UI design. With yeah, well, I mean, the, the, there are so like, like the distros I mentioned, like they support um, like using U-Boot with device tree, but then it uses UEFI to like, it, for several of those distros, they can use UEFI and RISC V. So we're still we're using the UEFI implementation that's in U-Boot to, to boot into, into Linux. Um, so that, that makes it a little bit less specific. So ideally, we could like you not know, have like a separate image for every single dev board. The ACPI stuff is being driven by the startups that are doing like data center type RISC V systems. And for that, I think they, they are expecting that enterprise distros like Red Hat are going to want ACPI. So I think that's why they're doing it. For, but for embedded, I don't think that'll be too relevant. And in terms of converting between device tree and ACPI, I don't know. Um, I'm not even too, I'm not too familiar with ACPI tables, but um, I don't know. Maybe that might be an interesting thing to do. Yeah? I would say ACPI and device tree are not really equivalent. OK, yeah. There was another comment that ACPI and device tree are not very equivalent, so yeah. Maybe, maybe converting between the two is not uh, possible. All right. Well, uh, hope to see you guys at the BOF if you're able to attend. All right, thank you.